good morning. And welcome to Kidmouth Baptist Church in the wonderful community of Kidmouth, Ontario, Canada. We're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 20. Without giving a long review, the context is that we only got a couple days before the crucifixion of our Lord. This has been going on now for almost a chapter. Back in 19, verse 41, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, knowing what was coming. And he talks about it, and I'm not going to get into that again, because in 70 AD, of course, where I am going into it, 70 AD, the temple, the city, the folks were wiped out by Titus. I'm hesitating because I want to keep going on that, and I'm not going to go on it. We do find out right after that that Jesus enters the temple. And he cleans out the temple for the second time. Beginning of his ministry, and here we are at the end of his ministry. He goes in and he cleanses the temple. He throws out the money changers. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. And Jesus begins teaching on the next day. And you've got to remember that the folks are not turned against him yet. Yet there's only a couple of days left where they do turn against him. And we see that in chapter 20. They question his authority, the leadership, because as Jesus is teaching all these folks, and there's still thousands of them, the leadership is there. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they're all there. And they hate him. They absolutely hate him. You know that. And then he tells them a parable. And that parable is rarely spoken of. At least I don't hear it much spoken of. But I think this is one of the key parables of all 40 parables in the scriptures. And we talked about that. God owns the vineyard, the vineyard being Israel. He sent the prophets. They, they got rid of the prophets. And then he sends his son, and they kill his son. And that's where he tells them that it's over for you. Others are going to replace you as the leadership. And we went on, I think we spent half the sermon talking about who the others were and are. Starting with the apostles, the disciples, the evangelists, the preachers, the teachers, and anyone else who's a true believer in Jesus Christ has the responsibility of spreading this gospel message. Well, Pharisees don't like this teaching because they knew, and it tells us right there, he, they knew that he was talking about them. Because what's going to happen? It tells us they're going to be killed and they're going to be replaced. And of course they were, if they lived that long, they, they were wiped out in, in 70 AD. Last week, the Pharisees wanted to trick Jesus. We've got to get rid of this guy. The people are liking this guy. He's, he's kind of taken over here. We've got we to gotta get rid of him. They hated him. They've hated him since chapter 4 of Luke. When he spoke against him back then. We've got to get rid of him. So they tried to trick him. The Pharisees wanted him to speak against the Romans. Now you've got to know this, that the, lo the locals, the folks, even, even the disciples... They expected when Messiah came, that Messiah would clean up their enemies, mainly the Romans, and set up his kingdom. That's what they expected. So we've got to make sure this doesn't happen. The only way it can happen is we've got to get Rome, get involved here. We've got to get Rome to not like what Jesus is saying. We've got to get Jesus to say something that would be an insurrection to Rome. And they would arrest him and hopefully execute him. What we saw last week didn't work. It didn't work. Should we pay our taxes? Remember? 
Should we pay our taxes? The law. The law says you shouldn't pay our taxes. It's the Jewish law. That wasn't the issue. That wasn't the issue. Render under Caesar that which is Caesar. Yes, pay your taxes. But under God, that which is God, God. So we see in the scripture throughout, what does God own? Especially for the believer, he owns everything. And so our talent, our treasure, our lives are his. He turned it beautifully around. That was last week. Pharisees, what does it say? Verse 26 of chapter 20. They were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. They didn't repent. They didn't bow the knee to Jesus. They became silent. Today's passage, we're going to find, I think, and I've studied this. I think we're going to see a fascinating revelation of the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we just we see that a lot. But today I think it's special. We know humanity has always felt the pull of the afterlife. Even in remote cultures throughout history, you see that they were thinking about the afterlife. And I believe it just beats in the, in the heart of every human. Well, what's going to happen after I die? Anybody been asked that question? A few thousand times? What do you think, Bruce? Is it, do you think, think there's more to it that happened? Yeah. yeah. I hope others have had that question. The Jews are no different. They're no different. And you find it in many of their historical writings. And there's a guy in the first century called Baruch. Baruch was a, a, a Jewish histor historian, and he believed there was a, an afterlife. But his belief was interesting because when you die and you go to the afterlife, you're going to be just the same as you are in this life. And I go, I'm not buying into this. <laughs> but then he says there's a metamorphosis, a change. Springtime, metamorphosis, change. And you get to decide whatever you want to be or do or be like. Sounds familiar, baby. That sounds familiar. That's what you will be forever. You can decide yourself what you want to be. That was Brooke. I have the book of Enoch. I don't know if anybody else has it or not. There's also a book called the book of Ezra. And those two wonderful Old Testament guys, like a great study. But they've written their own books. Now, they're not part of the canon of Scripture, and for good reason. We won't get into that today. But both of them, both of them, very similar to Baruch. And in the end, when you get there, it's confusion. And my God's not a God of confusion. They also have the Talmud. The Jews had the Talmud, the Talmud, and it's traditional Jewish theology, and we won't get into it today at all. But they also had the scriptures. Not, not as much as we had, have, but they had the scriptures. And the scriptures promise a resurrection. <coughs> the scriptures promise life after death. Psalm 16. David, the Lord will take him into his presence. And he'll live there forever in pleasure. That's biblical. That's a good one. Psalm 49, 15. Psalm 113, verse 18. You should know this one. If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into Sheol, you're there too. Hosea 6, the same. Isaiah 26, the same. And then we get Daniel chapter 12. I love Daniel. You want a good study? Study Daniel. Daniel chapter 12 makes it very clear in verse 2. There will be a resurrection of everybody. Some will go to everlasting life. Some will go to everlasting contempt. you got heaven. you got the lake of fire as it's described later. We call it hell. So the Jews had the scriptures as well as their traditional ideas about the resurrection life. 
There will be a body, a resurrection body, a resurrection under life, and a resurrection un or under contempt, disgrace. And that's the background I'd like you to have as we get into this passage today. But there is one group of Jews. They adamantly rejected the resurrection. The idea of the resurrection. And that was the Sadducees. So you've heard of the Pharisees. You've heard of the Herodians. Here's the Sadducees. No life to come. No hope for the future. As one wise old pastor said, sad, you see. <laughs> Acts 23, verse 8 says this, and I'll read it to you. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. They were opposite. The Sadducees were opposite to the Pharisees. Now, the chief priests were mostly Sadducees. You've got to get that point here. They ran the temple. They were the head honchos. They were the elite that ran the temple and all the business in the temple. The Sadducees. If you want to do a really good study, the parallel accounts to this are in Matthew 12 and Mark chapter, pardon me, Matthew 22 and Mark chapter 12. So remember that this exchange that's happening here when we read it is just a couple days before Jesus is crucified. It's incredible how he keeps his focus on this. But we have the Pharisees, we have the Sadducees, we have the Herodians, and they differ in their theology, but they have one thing in common. They wanted Jesus out of the way. They want him dead. I don't know if I've got time. If you, to run the temple, just to give an example, the business of the temple, because these Sadducees, they're rich guys. They're, they're the elite. They have highest, they're highly thought of in the sense that they're high up there. They're the elite. But they're rich, too. And the reason they got rich, for, most, for the most part, was they abused the folks. And the temple business was good business. And Passover is here, and every year we have Passover. And Joe Blow, well, I guess that's not a very Jewish name, is it? Um, Simon somebody. <laughs> brings his sacrifice for the for the temple at Passover, and he brings in a sacrifice to offer it to, to for Passover. And they say, hold on, hold on, hold on, Simon, Simon, there's a blemish there. I'm sorry, we can't use your. But we have ours for sale over here, at an exorbitant price. You're not allowed, but you can. And that went on. It went on for years, actually. If you do a little study on this, they made much money. They abused the folks big time. So Jesus last week had assaulted the theology of the Pharisees, if you remember. And now he's assaulting the, the economy of the Sadducees. He's cleaned them up. He's cleaned out the temple. Amazing. So these Sadducees, because they didn't believe in a resurrection, they put everything into now, today. Their whole stock was in today. This life, nothing to do with any life to come. They didn't believe it. And so they cooperated with Rome. Pharisees didn't want to cooperate with Rome other than to get them involved with killing Jesus. And the people hated the Sadducees. They hated them. They knew about the corruption. They couldn't do anything. I'm not going to talk about today on that, but isn't that true today? The corruption, we know the corruption that's going on. And yet, what can we do about it? And these folks were really, really susceptible to it. I find it fascinating, and I think I maybe have mentioned this last week, that in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, and everything else just about, and quite an area around Jerusalem as well, after 70 AD, you do not hear about Sadducees ever again in the writings. Fascinating to me. Okay, so let's turn to Luke chapter 20 here. Verse, begin at verse 27. Now there came to him, Jesus, some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection. And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, 
Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife he's, and he's childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. And the first took a wife and died. Follow this now. The first took a wife and died childless. And the second. And the third married her. And in the same way, all seven died, leaving no children. Are you with me so far? Finally, the woman died also. So Jesus, in the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they can't even die anymore because they're like angels. They're the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. I love this next verse. For they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. Brief moment of prayer. Father, thank you again for your word. And we just pray, Lord, that it will touch our hearts today. For Christ's sake, amen. So these Sadducees didn't believe there's a life to come. And yet, and yet they only accept Scripture. They, they, don't, they don't study any other commentaries. They study only the Scripture and only Moses' Scripture. The first five books of the Bible, we call it the Pentateuch. Okay? That's what they study. We are the experts. We know how to interpret we know how to apply these five books. This is God's word to us. And we are the guys that will tell you all about it. Get that point. That's a very important point. We're called the protectors of the faith. And they say there's no resurrection because Moses did not talk about a resurrection. Therefore, there's no resurrection, period. These guys live like there is no tomorrow. Now, my mom used to say to me, Bruce, you eat like there's no tomorrow. She did say that a lot. These guys lived like there was no tomorrow. On the other hand, the Pharisees would sit down with you and talk to you all day about the resurrection. They loved to discuss the resurrection. The Sadducees, on the, other hand, on the other hand, would make a joke about it. Frivolous. There's no resurrection. So what did they do? Well, they gave an example. Here's the example. Carol always wants me to have a title for my sermon. I wonder if I'm putting down one bride for seven brothers. I guess you did put that down, did you, Mark? Up there? Yeah. What about this situation, Jesus? They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trick him. They make a joke out of the resurrection. Here's a good one. They're questioning the man. They're giving their best shot here. The folks are rallying around Jesus. We've got to get them to turn against Jesus. And so they're going to ask him a question that nobody can answer. So they give this one to him. They give him the best shot. They want to get rid of him. He's a threat to them. If he wins this, if he wins the hearts and the hearts are continued over, the, the, they're, 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 where they are, in the elitism will be down here. And they don't want that. They're the ones that love to have the, the good seats in the banquet and certainly in the temple. They don't want that. Jesus is a threat. I want you to turn with me. And I want to read with you. Uh, John chapter 11. John clears it right up here pretty good. Verse 47. Verse 47 of John chapter 11. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council. Nothing's changed. And we're saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. 
if we let him go on like this, all men are going to believe in him. And the Romans are going to come and they're going to take our place. We don't care about the people. Our place. And our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you guys don't know anything. Nor do you take any into account that is expedient for you. One guy's got to die for the people so the whole nation won't perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for that nation. i got a whole sermon on that. We can't do that one today. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. To kill him. It's the best shot. These guys can't agree on theology, but they do agree. We've got to get rid of Jesus. So their approach is to get him. To get him arrested by the Romans. But the chief priests, the Sadducees, wanted to take a different approach than the Pharisees took. They didn't ever deny Jesus' miracles. They never denied his power. They, they, they feared losing their position. If I haven't made that clear it's got to be clear. They feared to lose their position, their place over the folks. The Pharisees, they wanted the Romans to come and arrest him based on the fact that they wanted to get him to say something against the Romans, and they couldn't. And here's the Sadducees. They don't want the Romans involved. They don't want to lose their position. And so Caiaphas says, wait a minute. He's got to die. Or we're going to lose everything. He's determined to kill Jesus. And so my first point this morning is, is the Sadducees' approach is to discredit Jesus. You've got to discredit him somehow. So we're going to ask him a question that nobody can answer. And this is their best shot. Pharisees gave their best shot last week. Here's the Sadducees' approach that we just looked at. The second point is they want to make this resurrection business sound absurd. Absurd. They call him teacher, verse 28. They question him saying, teacher. Teacher. Very honorable. They're raising the bar here. And what did they do? Catch this thing. They go, these guys are Moses. Moses followers, remember? They know all about Moses and his five books. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife and he's childless, his brother should marry his wife and raise up children to his brother. He brings up, they bring up, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25. And it was true. It was true. The context Back in Deuteronomy, the people were going into the land. Remember the land that God had promised them? They were going into the land. It was God's plan that if a wife lost her husband and was childless, that a, a relative married the wife. They had to keep the line because the land hadn't been divided up yet into tribes. Okay? The tribes come in. God lays it out for who's to get what, and, and, and Joshua, of course, is a big part of this. This is the context of Deuteronomy 25. It's a, it's a protective thing, the law at that time, to preserve that designation by God for them. The nation, the identification of the people, and the places he had designed for them. That's what's going on. You actually read about it back in Genesis 28, I think it is. That's where it gets started. And there's other examples of it later on. Do you remember? Great study. Remember Ruth? She had a husband named Elimelech. Elimelech. Elimelech died. She had no kids. And Ruth ended up a wonderful love story. A wonderful love story, ladies. Guys, too. She marries a guy named Boaz. Boaz is a relative. Boaz fell in love with her. And he married Ruth. 
Ruth and Boaz had a son. His name was Bo uh, Obed. Obed had a son. His name was Jesse. Jesse had a son. His name was David. And 28 generations later, Joseph and Mary had a son. His name was Jesus of Nazareth. The line had to be there because the prophecy was the Messiah was coming from Judah. From Judah. So this was all for the, the history of Israel at that time. So we see their absurdity. They, 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 they think it's absurd to think that there's a resurrection. Verse 29, and I'll give it to you again. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died childless, and the second, and the third married her. In the same way, all seven died, leaving no children. Seven husbands, one wife. And then she died. And she died. I'm not sure if I can say this or not. I wouldn't be, want to be number eight. And I find out that she died. Fascinating. So we have the approach that they took. We have the absurdity of the resurrection in their eyes. But now we have an answer from Scripture. This is the answer from Scripture. Verse 34 says this. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, I said the parallel passage, there's two of them, but the one that is really detailed is Matthew 22, verse 29. It's not in Luke, it's in Matthew. And what Matthew wrote down what Jesus said was, hey guys, you are mistaken. He's talking to the Sadducees. You're wrong. You're mistaken. You don't understand the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, remember, he just cleaned out the temple. This was their business. He just cleaned out. Now he's saying they prided themselves on knowing Moses' five books. You guys, he got it wrong. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. What a slap in the face they just got, and all the folks are listening. Fascinating to me. Jesus nails them. He nails them. I guess a good word is he indicted them. He indicted them. Nothing more painful. You guys have not only misled yourselves, you've misled the folks for hundreds of years here. And they threw in that business of the, you don't know the power of God. God created man. He created him. How do you think he couldn't resurrect them? You don't understand the power of God. He can raise them up. Sons of this age. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Okay, that's us. This is our temporal humanity. It's where we are right now. The sons of this age. We have marriage. Sex. Reproduction. Anything related to that at all. But it's for this life. It's not the next life. If you, any of you have Mormon background or anybody watching today, pay attention. Pay attention. Why? There's no more death. You get resurrected, there ain't no more death. I thought I heard an amen there. No more death. Nobody's got to be replaced. Just like the angels. There's a finite number of angels. They don't die. They don't reproduce. You don't need to be reproducing in heaven because there ain't no death after the resurrection. Sorry, ladies, if you don't think this is very nice, no marriage in heaven. I will say this, though, from a prophecy standpoint. There's going to be a wedding in heaven, one wedding in heaven, one bridegroom, one bride, and guess
guess what? For those of us who are true believers in Jesus Christ, we get to be married one time to the bridegroom because we're the bride. The true church of God from Pentecost on to the rapture or the translation of the church is the church, the bride of Christ. And someday during that seven-year tribulation when all hell's breaking loose on this earth, we will stand before him, the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of judgment. We will be rewarded. And then we'll have the marriage ceremony where God the Father presents to God the Son, the bridegroom, his bride, you and me. There will be a wedding, and it will last forever and forever. Verse 35. But those who are considered worthy, now circle that word worthy, to attain to that age and the resurrection from them, neither marry or are given in marriage. I think this is a direct warning to the Sadducees. You guys obviously aren't worthy. To attain. Since you don't believe in this, you don't believe in the angels as we saw over in John. You don't believe in the in the sons of God. You don't believe in the sons of the resurrection. You don't believe in the ages of come. You don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. You reject it all. You're obviously not worthy of this. Wow. The elite. The Bible, of course, you know this, and we've taught this many times. It makes it clear you, you, to be worthy, you need to have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. We're granted righteousness of God, and we talk about this all the time. Through what? Through faith, because of the grace that he offers us. He gives us something that we don't deserve. We don't deserve anything. And he gives it all to us because of his grace. And we have faith in that. And we get righteousness. So his bottom line to these guys is, your question is absurd. There ain't no marriage in heaven. Why? This is God's life. This isn't a sexual life that you're going to have. This is the life everlasting that God gives to us. You become sons of the resurrection. And that's not the main argument here. Go to verse 37. But the dead are raised. But that the dead are raised. Even Moses showed. Here he is. He's going right back at them because Moses is their baby. Moses is their guy. We know, we know everything about those first five books. What does it say? Even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And now he's not the, now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. All live to him. Forget the marriage thing. But hey, guys, the dead are raised. It's the resurrection thing that's the main point here. Jesus is coming after them because they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe that Moses said anything about the resurrection in those five books. And so Jesus quotes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. What does he quote? The truth about the resurrection. Remember the story of the burning bush? Anybody here see the Ten Commandments? Three of us? No. <laughs> Cecil, was it Cecil B. DeMille? Charlton Heston? Come on. Nobody else? Thank you. They do a great job on the burning bush in my book. Don't have to check it out this afternoon. I think it's not an Easter either. The burning bush. And that's where he calls the Lord, Moses calls him, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What does he say? Matthew makes this very clear. Exodus 3 6. He says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God. Of Jacob. In 22 or 32 of Matthew, he reminds him of this. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. He says, I am the God of Abraham. Isaac. They've been dead for years. Years. He doesn't say I was. He says, I am. 
And all three of these guys are dead. So is the God, God the God of dead people? No. Verse 38. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And all live in him. From our perspective, they're dead. From God's perspective, they're still alive. They're still alive. They all live to 56. So no, death does not end one's existence, folks. There is another life. Hollywood likes to play this stuff up. But there is another life. You know John 11 probably better than I do. John 11, he's very clear. We see this one. We read this one at funerals most of the time. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John sums it up beautifully, of course. You guys don't understand the scripture. And you sure don't understand the power of God. All right, I got one last point to make. So we've got their approach, the Sadducees' approach, their, the absurdity that they think the resurrection is. We see the answer from scriptures. The last one I'll call the astonishment of the Sadducees, of the folks. These guys are the legal experts, remember that. These are the, the theologians that will tell you how to interpret. And you know how you study your scriptures. How I study my scriptures, I trust you study. You observe, you observe, you observe, you observe. And you interpret. And while you're interpreting, you're applying it to your life for Christ's sake. That's how you learn. That's how you study the scriptures. You've got to observe. You've got to get all the context. You've got to answer all the who, what, where, why, when, and how questions. And then you do that. You interpret. And from interpretation, you roll right into and make very often while you're doing it, you're applying it to your life for his sake. The legal experts. What does it say? Well, Matthew's account again says they were astonished. My vernacular is, he blew their minds. Their minds were blown by this. And they're done. Verse 40 says, they did not have the courage to question him any longer about anything. They were done. And 40 years later, you never hear about them again. They're done. They gave their best shot, and then they disappeared. Matthew 22, 46, 46 says, No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day. No Sadducees dared challenge Jesus again. Well, we've got a couple minutes. What do we draw from this? What do we draw from this? Well, I like to think of this, and it just, again, as I was going through this this past week, the majesty of Jesus Christ. Fully God, yes, but he's also fully man. The, the wisdom that he has, the ability that, to control every discussion, we just see he's going to be dead in two days, and yet he's able to put these guys in their place. It's amazing to me. And, and the other thing that just boggles my mind is, as fully man, his devotion to Scripture. And i got to tell you, I love when I'm dealing with folks, I love to be able to go right to Scripture and say, this is what God says. But I hesitate sometimes because I'm not always sure where I'm going. Jesus always knew. Well, yeah, he was God. Yeah, but he was also man. He was also fully human. What else? Well, the affirmation, I guess is a good word, the affirmation of the promise of the resurrection. And if you're a believer, folks, you should be praising God. You should be praising God. You should be rejoicing in this. If you're not a believer, I'm going to say this one more time today, then you better become a believer. Become a believer. There is a resurrection. It's either to life or it's to contempt, as Daniel says. We call it the lake of fire. We find that out in Revelation. 
We call it today hell. It's one or the other. There's no in-between. There ain't no purgatory. It's heaven or it's hell. And I would highly recommend you choose Jesus. Well, how do I do that, Bruce? He makes it very clear. Acknowledge the fact you're a sinner. Repent of that sin. That means turn around. Go the opposite way. Stop it. And you ask forgiveness of that sin from the one, only one that can offer you forgiveness. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And he loves you so much. We're going to see when we get to chapter 23. We're going to look at it on Good Friday. He died for me. He died for you. He died for the whole world. And then he was resurrected. He was resurrected. And because of that resurrection, we are going to be resurrected. We are going to be resurrected unto life because of it. Let's pray.